And so the first presentation we have is actually on digital humanities and virtual reality. This is part of a year long study conducted at Lindenwood University in uh, the art history and visual culture department, um, going over the best way to integrate um, a virtual reality in this particular field and visual arts in general, and some of the challenges and best practices we have learned. Now we're only gonna over, uh, give you a broad overview of some of what we have found, but we are happy to share the extensive resources we have created for our faculty that are also available on our website, as well as the article that is more thorough that we're publishing for IHSES. So in, there we go, we'll go to the next one. It's just taking a moment. Hmm. There we go. So as far as the presenters, I currently serve as the Assistant Dean of Online and Graduate Programs in the School of Arts, Media, and Communications, and Dr. Trent Olson is Assistant Professor of Art History. Um, uh, together, we teach both graduate and undergraduate art history classes, and we have begun integrating as much as possible virtual reality experiences into every class that we have. So the reason for this is um, immersive realities, or XR, um, which includes everything from VR, AR, um, uh, so on, extended realities, um, is going to be pretty pervasive in every part of visual culture now. I mean, not only do we have it for video games, predominantly, that's how it saturated the market starting around 2012 to 2013, before it became a viable medium around 2015 with the headsets um, going to market, becoming more uh, cheaply available to everyone. But now we're actually making art in VR, films in VR. And so um, with the pandemic and people unable to travel, we could not take students students to see the various places and locations that we did previously through study abroad. So now was the perfect time to start integrating this into coursework. So as far as the timeline for the utilization of VR, we just wanted to note that it began as um, an instrument for flight simulators for the military and industry training and really hasn't changed that much um, since then. If you look at studies from the 90s, it's most commonly seen in applied fields, especially healthcare and the natural sciences. Um, I was actually looking on LinkedIn right before this and ads keep popping up for more AR VR experiences for anatomy and for uh, medical schools. And so this is not change. We only see it being adopted more in the visual arts and the digital humanities starting around the millennium, around 2001, when we see the digitization of world cultural heritage sites, um, such as at F uh, FHW. We also see um, virtual experiences in museums on a small scale beginning between 2001 and 2010, where you will have a headset that will um, be worn by visitors to have these short um, uh, experiences. And since then, with the democratization of the ability and access to VR, you have Google's arts and culture, and followed by the rapid mapping of most museums around the world, given the restrictions there are to visitors, um, we find that they had to find a way to give access, such as the Louvre digitizing hundreds of thousands of their works most recently and making them available. Go here. The theoretical approaches that we used um, in order to, um, dun, 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 I apologize, I don't know why this is taking a while to catch up. The theoretical approaches that we have used um, begins when the study of VR in education in the 1990s, really with behaviorism, cognitivism, and constructivism, and moves into the idea that VR helps us um, with experiential learning, um, uh, especially in studies by Kolb and Kolb around 2012. Most recently, um, the studies um, relating to VR are going to have to do with connectivism, and as you know, that's going to be how uh, new digital technologies, such as the internet, Wikipedia, um, and these virtual um, simulations and immersive realities are going to provide a new way of understanding the world and new ways to um, teach very complex and conceptual ideas or to immerse someone in a three-dimensional space. Now, the best practices that we have seen so far um, uh, and have tried to adopt are number one, to choose experiences that are truly innovative, that lead concretely to better student outcomes and student satisfaction. 
Well, secondly, we're also going to look at identifying disciplines where it makes the most sense. We're actually um, trying to scale out VR across our entire institution, and some disciplines are harder to find relevant existing applications. You need to make them yourself custom made in order to uh, make them relevant for certain areas, especially in business we have found, but then also some other areas in, um, say, English or literature. Um, so we're trying to then um, identify what makes the most sense starting out. And that's why we have always argued that we should start with a buy rather than build strategy. So most institutions don't have XR labs. They don't have people that have the ability to create original content. And so everyone should start by um, identifying what makes the most sense, the relevant applications by area, and then they can, um, uh, but they can then start building out their own experiences. And with that, I'm going to let Dr. Olson continue on and talk more about best practices here. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hudson. Uh, so picking up from here, uh, some recommendations that we would make given our experience over the last year integrating VR technology into the art history classroom is uh, first that VR experiences should be flipped, meaning students uh, engage in VR activities outside of class. Uh, this helps learning additionally to be catered and directed to them. Uh, their experiences should be social, uh, allowing students to interact with each other. Uh, there's also ways uh, with programs I'll talk about in a moment for students and faculty members to interact within a, a VR application. As Dr. Hudson uh, commented, we recommend beginning with existing uh, applications and uh, we have compiled a, a series of resources using XR technology that allow students in a, a multi of different fields to start engaging with VR, uh, particularly for art history, we have them broken down by chronology and geographical period. Um, once you start utilizing uh, VR or different augment, uh, integrative realities with students, we recommend uh, garnering feedback from them to see how the experience goes so that you can then tailor it uh, to meet their needs. And we also recommend uh, using VR technology to enhance learning, enhance uh, like a module or a unit that's already being taught in class and not to replace that education, but it can be used as a very effective supplementary tool. There are also a lot of considerations to make, um, such as student accessibility to technology, of course. Um, so if you don't have a lab, there are other things you can do, such as AR uh, apps that are available for your phone. Also, uh, you need to, if you start using VR technology, be mindful of things like VR sickness. So start with um, smaller applications that only require them to log in for a few minutes at a time and start getting accustomed to the movement and view of a VR app. Next slide. Oh, I uh, Dr. Hudson, if you skip to the next one then. So some of the apps and programs that we've found or that we could recommend, uh, one is Google Arts and Culture. You can download this uh, onto your smartphone and in doing a survey with our students, we found that uh, essentially all students in our department have a smartphone. So the Google Arts and Culture, for example, you can download the app and you can see uh, project works via augmented reality into your own space. Uh, you can also see them in a street view to view the view a work of art in the gallery where it, it exists. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one thing that we've started utilizing is uh, the app through the Oculus Quest 2, which is Wander. Uh, which is built out uh, similar to Google Street, where you can go to any monument or uh, also a large number of museum galleries, and you can meet, uh, it can become a social experience where you can meet students at a site, say as we have the Eiffel Tower projected here, and it will allow you to talk or uh, give a, a small presentation to your students who joined you there at that site. Uh, next slide. One other, um, brief application that we've found is Oculus TV has a series of videos of cities around the world so students could go and take a tour in VR of a city that you're discussing in, in conjunction with your class. And our final slide, 
And this is just to give you a, a small sampling of some of our preliminary findings from surveys that we've uh, given out to graduate and undergraduate students. We've found that most students are slightly familiar with VR technology, while they feel moderately knowledgeable about technology in general. And students have responded positively to our initial surveys, agreeing that uh, VR would assist in better learning outcomes, and they feel that it would be helpful to augment or supplement their learning about specific topics. Um, that is what we'll say uh, about our preliminary findings. Um, we have, of course, our information here, and we're happy to take any questions uh, regarding our implementation of VR te technology in the art history classroom. Thank you. Yep. We will um, we'll hold the questions till the end because we only have really 10 minutes to get through five presentations. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Olson. Now I'm going to stop sharing. And so our next presenter is going to be Xiangling Lin. If you're here, we'll be presenting on examining the picture book production process, the creative autonomy of picture book artists. So if you're ready to take it away, you can share your screen and begin when you're ready. Okay. Sorry, let me show my screen. Yeah, um, Hey, do you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Thank okay. you. Okay, so my topic is to examine the picture book production process and um, the creative autonomy of the picture book artist. So here's my outline. Um, I will uh, have an introductions and research questions, objectives and research methods. And then the last one is the future plan. So um, do you know what is picture books? Um, there are so many people wondering that, what is the difference between um, picture books and illustrated books? Um, illustrated book is the illustration to decorate the text. So um, we, need to, we need a text that to help us to understand the content. So you can look at the screen. Here is um, a magazine. If we cover the text, we can, we are hard to understand the content, right? So um, the picture book is the illustration tell you the stories. So sometimes you don't need any words that you can still, un still understand um, and can feel the feeling that the artist is trying to create. So I organized the, like um, six value of the picture books. The first one is like um, picture book is not just a book for children. It's also provide an opportunity for a family to spend time together. And like the second one, um, the artistic values that one artist mentioned that um, every picture book are like a tiny art galleries. So it's not just read a story, but also can cultivate um, the reader's uh, authentic feelings. And also some book can guide us to deal with our emotionals. Um, like you can see the left side, um, it's one of my favorite picture book called Dark, Death and the Tulip. It teaches us um, how to face the death and to tell us it's not horrifies. So, and sorry, it also can combat the culture or combine the life experience to show the readers. So I think that is the power of the picture book. And according to the statistics shows that the children's book market has grown. And in Taiwan, the largest um, Chan bookstore called Athlete, um, they even predict that even the phenomena of the low birth rate in Taiwan, but the parents still will invest um, more like book for their baby 
because um, there is, um, they want to um, cut them, cultivate them, become a great person. And also the internet change people's reading behavior. So people get used to read images or videos. So the as they predict uh, in the 2025, uh, the demand of the picture books and comics book will increase. So let's talk about the current situation of Taiwan picture book industry. Um, there are 90% of picture books are import one abroad. Um, if you go into a bookstore in Taiwan, you can feel immediately and the parents like to buy the picture book from abroad because they think the quality, um, the the quality are better than Taiwan original picture books. And second one is uh, most of Taiwanese people think picture book is only for children. So they got some like um, stereotype that they think picture book is very childish, but actually it's not. Um, for example, you can see the pictures that Japan have like more than um, 60 picture book museum in the different cities. So that's how they treat picture books. So, um, and the third one is um, due to people re relied on import picture books. So there are few publishing house willing to spend time to spend time or money to produce original picture books. And the artist or the writer is hard to survive because of the issue of, of low pay. And that's the reason why these people cannot spend time to make a good picture book. So um, most of creators need to find another job or cases to support their life. And also um, let's talk about the productions. Um, sorry. At the beginning, the editor will hunt or to find a great stories from writers, or sometimes the writers will um, send us send their story to the publishing house. And until the editor accept the story, um, they will find the editor will find a suitable artist to draw the story. So basically the artist will be the last one to finish the stories. But um, so I call these, these three people are picture book stakeholders. And I want to know that because we know some artists, there are very few spirits and emotional sensitive. So when a book has two authors, which is artists and writers, so um, they sometimes also need to against to or collaborate with the commercial. The commercial means the from the editor's perspective. So I really want to know how they um, collaborate with each other. So here's my research questions. Um, the first one is I want to know the position of the picture book in the publishing industry. And the second one is I want to um, understand how these three people work together. And the last one is to see how artists to um, perceive their values and what resource do they get or not. So um, I will send the uh, questionnaire to publish house um, to um, help me answer the research question once. And I would do the choose one case and choose one publish house and do the semi structure interview to answer my research question two and three. So I select one case called Baba culture. And um, the reason I, I choose Baba culture in Taiwan as my case study, because um, they only publish Taiwan original picture books. And the, they are willing to give the young artist or writer an opportunity to create their books. So I picked two books from Baba culture as my cases. 
and I want to interview them and trying to compare with these two. So uh, the first one is called The Boy Walking at Night. And the second one is Don't Cut My Hair. But this one is more special because um, the editor and the writer are the same person. But I will try to understand how she switched her identities or how she um, communicate with the artist to see how this artist to, um, will um, communicate with her. So um, I think I will re-examine the value of the picture book artist in Taiwan for sure, and to develop the some kind of like new creative collaboration pattern for the publishing house. So um, here is my presentation. Thank you.